I'm Andrew J. Boyle. Welcome to North by Norway. A tiny milestone for the podcast number 10. Which I'm going to mark by presenting a short sketch of 10 Norwegians whose stories I find inspiring. A real mixed bunch, but all trailblazers. Five women, five men. You can see portraits of all of them on my website, andrewjboyle.com, all as one word. I've got my daughter Solvay, who's an actor in New York, along to help. Here we go. Number one. She was born in 1943. She came from Grønneløkka, a working class area in downtown Oslo. She is known for her legal fight against financial corruption in Europe. Her name, Eva Jolie. Well, she was born Guru Eva Farset. She moved to Paris as an au pair when she was 20 and married into the Jolie family for which she worked. 25 years later, Eva Jolie had broken all sorts of barriers to become an investigating magistrate for the High Court in Paris. She specialised in white-collar crime, and in 1994 she would be lead investigating magistrate in Europe's biggest fraud inquiry since the war. The executives running the French oil company Elf Aquitaine used it almost like their private bank, lavishing bribes, extravagant gifts on politicians and mistresses. Jolie ran the notorious case against them, and won. She is perhaps the only living Norwegian woman to see her career immortalised in two films and to be played by two great actresses. In the TV film Les Prédateurs, The Predators, she was played by Nicole Garcia. The story of the elf scandal was also told in the cinema thriller L'Ivresse du Pouvoir, known in English as The Comedy of Power, where the character based on Jolie was played by that leading light of French film, Isabelle Huppert. The film critic of the BBC had this to say about the film, and it can also stand as a tribute to a great Norwegian. Determined to expose corrupt businessmen at any cost, the magistrate puts her marriage, career and life on the line as she interrogates men who've been dipping into the company pot to pay for expensive holidays and mistresses. She is an intelligent woman who only becomes stronger when she's underestimated. Number two. He was born in... 1875. He came from... Nesseby, in the far north right up by the Russian border. He is known for being the first person from the Sami minority to win a seat in Parliament. His name? Isak Saba. The Sami are the indigenous people in the far north of Norway, Sweden and Finland, as well as Russia's Murmansk region. This cultural homeland is known as Sapmi, and the traditional ways of living here have been centred on fishing the sea and the herding of reindeer. Today, the Sami people number about 80,000, over half of which live in the far north of Norway. Isak Saba was born in the coastal village of Nesseby. It is roughly the same distance from Nesseby to Oslo as it is from Oslo to Vienna or Budapest. And culturally, Nesseby could be on another continent. Increasingly throughout the 19th century, 
the government of Norway pursued an aggressive colonization of the northern territories. The culture of the Sami, indeed the whole way of life living off the land, was portrayed as backward or primitive. By the early 1900s, the process of Norwegianization had moved into the school. Sami children were compelled to attend Norwegian schools and only speak Norwegian. Isak Saba qualified as a teacher at the Teacher Training College in Tromsø, and he quickly identified the classroom as a battleground for cultural conflict. Here he is in 1906 trying to draw up some lines of demarcation. I agree that the Sami people must learn to use the Norwegian language as proficiently as Norwegians. Without it, they will be unable to compete. If, however, the process of Norwegianization means that the Sami have to renounce their culture and melt together with the Norwegians, you can count me out. The goal of Norwegianization is simply to destroy the Sami culture. In the general election of 1906, Isak Saba became the first Sami to be elected to the Norwegian parliament, the Storting. He was also an avid collector and transcriber of folk memories, and the author of the poem called Sami Soga Lavla. In 1986, it became the official national anthem of the Sami people. Number three. She was born in 1845. She came from Holmestrand on the west bank of the Oslofjord. She is known for being one of the finest painters of her generation. Her name, Harriet Bakker. The junction town of Sandvika, a few miles west of Oslo, has surrendered its appeal to the motor car. It's no longer the sort of place to make tourists stop and take a closer look. However, it does have three things going for it. First, that lovely lady, my partner Sonia, comes from Sandvika. Second, Sandvika lies on the coast of the inner Oslo fjord. And third, the nearby Tarnum Plateau. Now, this huge expanse of peaceful countryside lies high, high above the motorways and the commercial bustle. Fields, forests, hedgerows, and the clouds just above your head. And here for nearly a thousand years has stood Tarnum Church, a small building in whitewashed stone and with a spire reaching for the sky. When Harriet Bakker was about forty-five and felt she'd learned what she could from painter colleagues in Paris, she came to live in Sandvika and to paint the interior of this medieval church. You can see her coloristic masterpiece from the church on my webpage or search for it on Wikipedia. The title is Christening in Tarnum Church. Bakker was a central figure in Norwegian art of the period, both as an artist and teacher. Her breakthrough had come in Paris in 1880, when her painting Solitude was one of the critical highlights of that year's Salon de Paris. She was then 35, quite an advanced age for a newcomer. But considering the huge challenges any woman met trying to live as a professional artist, (laughs) including the fact that most academies were closed to them. Well, any woman catching the eye of the art establishment was really something special. She is regarded as a great colourist and an early impressionist. Here, late in life, she looks back on her career. It's my experience that if you devote yourself to studying light and shade and the strict principles of drawing, you will be inspired to find your own colour palette. It will come almost as a gift. 
I think that my coloration could only reach me by way of impressionism. There they are, my little specks of colour, in their immovable constellations. They are like stars in the night sky, winking and waving to each other, like chords in music, sounding perfectly in tune with each other in coloristic play. Number four. He was born in... 1957. He came from... Stavanger, on the south coast. And he is known for... Humanitarian work in and for crisis zones. His name... Jan Egeland. Not as famous as Gar Störe. Not a daddy's boy like Jens. But when hand grenades are flying, there's just one man you can trust. When there's war and all is hell, send in Jan Egeland, the United Nations superhero man. And he stares into the mirror, flexing muscles in the night, and says, Boy, I think you're ready to protect some human rights. When there's war and all is hell, bring in Jan Egeland, the United Nations superhero man. They're better known for their viral hit What Does the Fox Say? But comedy duo Ilvis also wrote this spoof power ballad about Jan Egeland, probably the only pop tribute ever written about a United Nations official. Egeland really does stick out from the crowd. Whenever there is a report on television news from famine areas or refugee camps, it's a pretty good bet that his sober, concerned face will pop up on screen, appealing for help. In the early 2000s, he was in charge of humanitarian affairs and emergency relief for the United Nations. Since then, he has worked at Human Rights Watch and become Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council. We saw him most recently in the first days of the Russian invasion, travelling between border crossings to find out how bad the refugee situation was. In 2006, Time magazine named him one of their 100 people who shaped the world gave this as one of their reasons. You will surely hear his voice whenever our conscience needs a little reminder. Number five. She was born in 1868. She came from Hamar on Lake Mursa, south of Lillehammer. She is known for being a pioneer of reproductive rights for women. Her name, Katte Anker Müller. The episode photo for this week's podcast is of a statue of a well-to-do woman in the early 1900s. She looks as if she is sitting with the day's newspaper on her lap, or perhaps a book, for the statue stands outside my own public library in the centre of Frederikstad. But it's not a newspaper or book. It's the manuscript of a magnificent lecture that changed Norwegian society. Katte Ankermüller is about to rise from her seat and educate an audience of politicians, all men, about the disgraceful state of women's rights in their country. Why? she asked. Should two small words... Inside a marriage? Outside a marriage? Have such consequences for a child's fate? A child is still a child, she said, and deserves all the care and support we can give it. In 1915, radical children's laws were passed in Norway, largely due to Muller's activism. Children of unmarried couples could now inherit from the father, and the living conditions of poor children and mothers improved. It's a sort of truism that members of the bourgeoisie have so much time and money on their hands they can afford to get involved in society. In the case of Katte Anker Müller, 
her wealth almost barred her from activism. At the age of 20, she married a wealthy landowner and moved to his manor farm outside Frederikstad. She knew nothing of keeping a house, far less a farm. I grew up in that phase of female emancipation when all housework was despised. My mother and father were annoyed with us girls if we didn't keep up to date with world affairs in the newspaper. She was almost suffocated by the farm. However, from the women married to her many tenant farmers, Muller came to learn all there was to know about the life of the poor, especially about the degradation of constant pregnancy that many farm women went through. She would later look back and see it as a godsend that, in 1900, the manor farm burnt to the ground. For it allowed her to move to the capital and become engaged in fighting for women's rights. So, back to that statue. Katja Anker Müller is about to rise and give her lecture on the subject of abortion, the liberation of mothers. Its words seem to have lost little of their resonance. A young woman in this predicament feels as much revulsion for having to commit this act as she feels astonishment upon learning that some outside person has authority over her. In an area of her life she feels to be her personal property. It feels like an insult, a humiliation we did not deserve. And I catalogued it in my mind along with all the other assaults and injustices that men commit upon women because they stand outside our way of thinking, our experience, our emotions. Number six. He was born in... 1862. He came from the city centre of Christiania, today's Oslo. He is known for being the father of the weather forecast. His name? Wilhelm Bjerknes. To anyone unfamiliar with Bergen, it might seem astonishing that the history of modern scientific weather forecasting began there. In the early 1900s, Bergen was a small provincial town that didn't even have a university. To Norwegians, however, in fact, to pretty much anyone who has been to Bergen, it seems the ideal place to get to grips with the weather. From under their umbrellas, which are often turned inside out by the gusts blowing in from the North Sea, the people of Bergen all want to know one thing. Will it ever stop raining? Well, if anyone could tell you, Wilhelm Bjerknes could. When he established his team around him in 1917, he said, Here we are, washed ashore on Europe's stormiest and, meteorologically speaking, most dramatic coast. If we scientists are able to extend our theories into the realm of a useful prediction, this is probably the place to do it. Bjerknes always regarded weather science as something of a distraction from his real passion, theoretical physics. While he was professor of mathematical physics in Stockholm, he developed new models for how currents of water formed and moved in the ocean. It turned out that his models could also be applied to the atmosphere. Equally important, he realised that huge amounts of data had to be constantly gathered. He quickly established a network of observation points along the west coast of Norway to register wind pressure, temperature and barometric pressure at many localities. In this way, the tendency of what we today call a warm front or a cold front could be followed in real time. And... Working from his models, 
the future behavior predicted. So it was that the 1st of July 1918 saw the birth of the modern forecast. Today, practically all weather forecasting is based on principles devised by Wilhelm Bjerknes. Number seven, born in 1920, came from Sande to the west of the Oslo Fjord, known for being a leader of the Norwegian resistance during the Second World War. Name? Well, they called him Asla. The XU Group was the principal clandestine organization in the Norwegian resistance, working to collect intelligence about the German occupying force. And the second in command was called Aslak. Now, this was a cover name to preserve security. Almost nobody in the resistance knew who Aslak was, and even at meetings, nobody got to see him. The second in command sat him in an adjoining room. After the war, one of the agents recalled. He would knock on the wall when he had something to say and send his message on a piece of paper. Oh, and he always had good input. I built up a huge respect for him. I'd formed a mental picture of Aslak, <laughs> perhaps modelled on the figure of Aslak the blacksmith in Peer Gint, a large, muscular man with black hair and beard. But without that dazzling intelligence, our Aslak demonstrated. When, after the war, I finally got to meet and shake Aslak by the hand, I think I must have looked pretty stupid. Only in peacetime did the agent find out that Aslak's real name was Anna Sophia Östvet, not a burly blacksmith, but a beautiful, slender girl of twenty-five. In the first years of the war, she was involved printing and distributing illegal newspapers, and in 1941 she was recruited by the XU Group. It was part of Anna Sophia's job in the organization to get resistance fighters out of Norway when they were in danger. The routine was to find an escape route over the border to Sweden. In 1942, she got news that the Gestapo were hunting her. She refused to leave her country in its time of need. My family thought that I had escaped to Sweden, but instead I got a new appearance. There was a hairdresser down by Bislett Stadium that dyed my blonde hair and eyebrows every fortnight. I never went anywhere without knowing who was in front of me, who was behind. I had a cyanide pill everywhere I went. It was under my pillow at night, and I often had it in my mouth if I was in a difficult situation. <laughs> but preferably not when I was eating. I've never been afraid to die, but I was very frightened by the thought of torture and giving up the names of our agents. After the end of the war, she received a scholarship and went to study chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. Number eight. He was born in... 1947. He came from... The inland town of Müssen, to the southeast of Oslo. He is known for... A groundbreaking fusion of folk music with jazz. His name... Jan Garbarek. Everyone loves a saxophone noodle. And Jan Garbarek is the musician who took the noodle and made it Norse. In the late 1960s, Garbarek grew up playing free jazz inspired by American greats of the day like John Coltrane and Albert Ayler. But the real turning point came in 1969 when he was taken under the wing of the new independent ECM label in Germany. ECM is known for its distinctive sound, with its crystal clarity and feeling of space around each instrument. 
it was ideal for Gabarek. In the Encyclopedia of Popular Music, Colin Larkin wrote that Garbarek's style incorporates a sharp-edged tone, long, keening, sustained notes, and generous use of silence. It is especially that word, keening, that leads us on to his most notable contribution to European music. Keening is the prolonged, high-pitched lament of grief and longing sung by Irish and Scottish women at funerals. In Garbarek's music, it represents a unique way of fusing folk music with jazz or with classical styles. In the 1990s, it was impossible to attend a Nashpiel without someone slipping on the haunting plain chant tones of officium. ECM describe it as one of the most significant recordings of Garbarek's career. It was recorded at a monastery in Austria with a Hilliard ensemble, a vocal quartet. Garbarek's sax is a fifth voice. It weaves soaring, swooping lines around the polyphony of the quartet, creating effects that are as entrancing as they are unexpected. Whether I like it or not, Garbarek once said, I am locked into a certain vocabulary or phraseology that is linked to Norwegian folk music. Ah, oh, we all love it. The Noodle of the Norse. Numbers 9 and 10. She was born in 1963. He was born in 1962. She came from the island of Fosnavog. He came from the neighbouring island of Harreid. And she and he are known for the discoveries they've made in neuroscience. Their names... Maybrit Moser, maiden name Andreasen, and Edvard Moser. I want to tell you three remarkable things about Maybrit and Edvard Moser. First, in 2014, the married couple, together with John O'Keefe, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine. It was for their discovery of what they termed our inner GPS, as to say their discovery of cells in the brain that constitute a positioning system. These cells ensure that we can navigate our environment. In itself, their scientific achievement is remarkable. You might also consider it remarkable that a married couple can work so well together as a team, both at home, they have two daughters, and in the lab. Then you'll be surprised as I was, to learn that the Moosers were the fifth married couple to receive a Nobel Prize. Pierre and Marie Curie were the first. And since 2014, there has been a sixth couple. Unfortunately, in 2016, the Moosers got divorced. And remarkable fact number two is this. They never for one moment considered breaking up their tight-knit research team. Maybrit Moosir has said this. We have a common vision, one that is so strong it overrides other matters. We are excellent at working together. Our research goals are to better understand the processes of the brain and perhaps also to make advances in the fight against Alzheimer's. It is with remarkable fact number three that I want to round off this tour of some inspiring Norwegians. Both Maybrit and Edvard come from tiny islands, neighbouring islands, out in the coastal archipelago on the west coast. They are fishing communities in the coastal Bible Belt. For those that believe you have to come from wealth and influence to make it to the top of any career, they are wonderful role models, and also a great advert for the flat class structure of Norway. This is what Maybrit says to her young researchers. The most important thing you can do is be honest with yourself about what your passion in life is. If you do that, no matter what you choose, 
you can go far. When I think back, that has been important for me in science. My mum said to me, we are born naked and we are going to die naked. So don't care about material things, but about passion and that you want to do something. Next time, the astonishing plans by Adolf Hitler to build a secret city in Norway. But for now, tusen tack för att du hörte på. Thanks for listening. And if you love the cool north, tell all your cool friends. Mm-hmm.